Oh my god, it's a regular ass after dark vlog. Except it's daytime, and for some reason that means I'm not wearing sunglasses. I wanted to talk a little bit more on the subject of mediocrity after my, you know, big video. We have accepted mediocrity it was sort of a comeback video for my channel. Got a lot of attention. Very big edit from Davu that was, in my opinion, masterful. He really turned it into like a film on YouTube, which was appropriate given the context of the message of the video being essentially that not enough people are willing to put in the extra effort and time investment into a product to make it better and to sell their product on the basis of that product superiority, essentially. Um, you know, to basically make the best possible product and draw people to that. Because it is not currently incentivized within the structures of the industries of anime or YouTube to do so. And I realized that because I explored that idea in such a roundabout way in the video, um, maybe not everyone completely, like, you know, latched onto that as the core idea or were distracted somewhere along the way by certain other things that, um, that might have clouded what I meant. For instance, I, my long tangent about 80s anime and how 80s, the 80s were just the best decade. Now, this is kind of an ironic segment because of the fact that I have historically been someone who champions modern anime. I made a video called Anime Shit Now a few years ago where I was talking about the fact that anime was not shit now. That anime, like, is still good and that there's as much good stuff coming out now as there had ever been. And that was truer at the time than it is now, in my opinion. But it's particularly the ways that anime has broken down over really the last couple of years that have bothered me. And it's not even that I think that like anime has just gone to shit. There's still, there's still lots of good stuff being made. It's just that the opportunity to make really great stuff is more present than it's ever been. And I don't feel it's being taken advantage of because of cowardice towards taking risks. And because of the fact that I've gotten very interested in marketing and sort of the business side of what I do and figuring out how to reconcile the business aspect of what I do with the artistic side of it, which has been my struggle essentially forever. I mean, the kind of stuff that I really like to create, the kind of like aesthetic that I appreciate, what I would describe as the cluster punk aesthetic is not exactly broad like it's not something that I expect a whole lot of people to resonate with but certain people really do you know there are certain people who really love even my most experimental music there are some people who you know enjoy my really fucking weird out there art vlogs that just come from a place of expression that's different from the kind of stuff that I do in my more mainstream videos and probably doesn't appeal to a lot of people or might even just come off as fucking existing for no reason like some some people I think see when they see content that they don't understand what the appeal of it is they can't really wrap their brain around the fact that it exists like why would this exist uh, like it must just be it must be that it was trying to be good and failed you know and that's not usually the case it's that it's it's good in a different way it's good in a way that not everyone's going to understand and that's fine. And you might even say that that is the definition of being bad because what, you know, if we're talking about any kind of objective standard, then at best you have consensus. So like, yeah, you, you could say that that's the same as being bad if you believe in, in things like that, but I'm getting off in the weeds here. Inevitably, the more time you spend doing something and consuming things and analyzing things and trying to figure out what makes things good, be that other people's things or your own, you're going to eventually learn how to make something good. Like, there's a clear blueprint. We all kind of know how to do it. If you are a YouTube analyst and you are good, like, if people generally trust your opinions, it must mean you understand storytelling. Like, you've clearly pointed out like, 
what makes a movie good by talking about good movies, if you've done so. You can talk about what makes a movie bad by talking about bad movies. Maybe you just haven't felt inspired to write your own movie, or it's just not something you're you're aiming to do, but you understand how. And because of that, you know that if there is something more ambitious you want to do, and you know how to do it, you have to be willing to commit the time to doing that thing. And it might be something completely different from what you have been leaning on and what is, you know, a known success. Let's talk about the risk Kyoto Animation took, for instance. This is a studio that's very, it's known for the fact that it's sort of insular. It's out of the way. It's in Kyoto. It's not related to most of the studios and the melting pot of anime talent that is Tokyo. So it's kind of its own island unto itself. And in the early days, the productions that they did were mostly for like, you know, they, they were not like original productions that they owned the intellectual property of. They were like, you know, made with a, with a production committee um, led by a publisher of the Haruhi Light novels and, um, and the Full Metal Panic Light novels. I don't remember the name of the publisher off the top of my head. I'll put it on screen, I guess. But... They were doing a lot of work with this publisher, and that was very successful for them. You know, Haruhi was a very successful show, Lucky Star was a very successful show, but this studio decided to take a big risk, and instead of continuing to, you know, work with this this major publisher on these major IPs, creating majorly big hits which they can't, you know, reap all the rewards from because ultimately they don't own the rights to this stuff. So, like, the overall merch sales of Haruhi, you know, isn't going to trickle that much back to, to them compared to if they owned the IPs of their shows, you know. So, instead of continuing to work with that studio, they abandon these sure thing franchises like Haruhi you know, they made, they made the big movie and then they fucked off. They didn't make a thousand spinoffs. They went off to go do their own thing. They started um, essentially harvesting light novel authors by holding, like, contests where people submit light novels and whoever wins the contest, they will, you know, I guess buy your IP and make an anime out of it. And then now they, you know... They're, they're, they've got a bigger stake in this thing. Now, granted, they're still working with production committees. It's not like they're doing this by themselves. You know, uh, Pony Canyon is a big part of why EBK Euphonium is a thing. But, like, the point is that they're not exclusively working with these, these big companies. They're also trying to make their own original properties and market it essentially by themselves. And they do an amazing job of doing so through fucking gifts. And I'm going to make a whole video about that later, but my point is that it's a bigger risk, but it allows them to, you know, work at their own pace to, you know, basically be in full control of the product to make it as good as they want and then reap as much of the benefit from it as they possibly can. And granted, personally, I don't think that Kyoto Animation's original IPs are like, any as good as their uh, as their adaptations are, except for maybe Tamako Market can compete. But it's just exciting to even see a show like Tamako Market that is so kind of off kilter and weird. It's got such a weird mishmash of elements that I on paper doesn't sound like you could sell this show to anybody. Like it's like a a fat obnoxious bird from some southern island migrates to Japan to look for a wife for the prince of that island, but he just lands in a shopping center and hangs out with a high school girl while she goes about her everyday life. Um, and there's, like, a trans character, and there's, like, a gay character, and there's, like, all kinds of fun stuff that maybe wouldn't have been in a major production, who knows. Point being, its existence excites me, and I hope that Kyoto Animation continues this trend, possibly with some fucking, get some goddamn better light novels from your audience. But even with the terrible scripts that they sometimes work with, they produce the best looking anime on TV. Like, whether you appreciate this aesthetic, or you, really care about like the types of stories that they're telling these shows have like a level of polish 
like that and I'm I'm not even talking about that like I think they are better looking as in they appeal to my taste more though that is often the case. I just think that there is a clear level of craftsmanship on display that just isn't put into anything else on television that is animated practically in the world. Like name a studio making stuff consistently that looks better than Kyoto Animation. Production IG nah. close second and sunrise. Because anime has gotten harder and harder to fund and there is anime has gotten harder to fund because of the fact that people don't spend money on it anymore and there's so many shows and there's so much to choose from that they're all in competition with each other and so many new offshoot studios want to come out and try to do their own things but they don't you know have that kind of big financial push behind them that some studios can get and occasionally you get producers who will take big risks canapa just had a great video about um several anime producers who are exactly the type of risk takers that i think need to exist to make anime good like this guy who came into the industry and was like i want to work with ghibli gainax and Jun Maeda, I don't know, I don't know why that guy made it onto this list of his his people he wanted to work with, but they made Angel Beats together, which is my favorite Jun Maeda product, so that's fine. The point being that these interesting original anime made by creators who this guy respected, such as Gurren Lagan, which is one of the most beloved anime in existence by critics and fans alike of the 2000s for sure. Um, that series could only exist because someone was willing to just like bank on the talents of Hiroyuki Maishi and the crew at Gainax and you know that crew specifically as Kanepa says in this video like got the backing of the people they worked with uh in the future but you know that's what made this possible and so I don't know if it's just that there's a conception of there not being enough talent because there's plenty of talent. We know there's tons and tons of fucking talent going around because new animators are springing up constantly who people talk about. I'm sure plenty of these people can work as directors, but, like, the anime industry is very much a pay-your-dues kind of place. That's Japan in general. That's the whole business structure of the country. It's what is constantly mocked in anime that is commentary on anime production. I was just re-watching... Um, I mean, I just rewatched Eva... And then Cutie Honey by Hideaki Anno. And both of them have lots of commentary on the problems of bureaucracy and of social hierarchies and how, like, you know, the lack of faith in young people. There's a scene in Cutie Honey where Cutie Honey, who is a transforming magical girl, but she's also an office lady. She comes into her office late and her boss is like, what's with these young people? Like, they don't do anything. Meanwhile, she had just saved the day. Like, she's the one who is cutie honey, who is just out saving the day. But she came to work late at this work at this workplace where almost everybody is redundant. There's a huge social structure. There's, like, five different levels of manager. They all sit in a circle around each other and just tell one another what to do in a, in a line. And what her job is is just to, like, bring tea to the right person in the right order. Like, the entire scene is just made to make fun of, you know, this social hierarchy that, you know, people are not going to just hand over a bunch of money to a young, talented creator in a marketplace where they're concerned about making that money back. I watched Dead Leaves for the first time a few months ago. Um, I don't know why I had put it off for so long when I'm such a huge Imaishi fan, but it's a masterpiece. It's 50 minutes long of just pure animation spectacle with a bunch of extremely talented animators. Production IG produced it. It was made in 2004. They marketed the fuck out of it because at the time anime was taking off in the US in DVD sales and a lot of the stuff that was big here or worldwide in general was like the artsier more animator driven shit so I have a bunch of magazines that are full of fucking ads for dead leaves a, a, a OVA that no one talks about that like no one saw 
because it is just fucking weird. And, like, when you read reviews of it, they all just described it as a weird, crass, like, there's a guy who's got a dick for a head that spews cum and stuff. And, like, they would just describe it as, like, this filthy, disgusting movie, which is why I didn't watch it growing up, not realizing that, like, these people are underselling that it is one of the most, like unbelievably beautifully animated things ever and that it's dripping with personality that it tells so much story in its images alone and even has elements of commentary in it like about society it has things to say you know it's not like all about a message it's more about an animator showcase but you know it's not just a complete fucking mindless nonsense escapade like the animation is all extremely well considered point being that was 2004 that was when dvds were like hot shit and home video was a big deal and otaku would buy the same blu-ray six times and that's why they started making stuff for otaku because otaku would buy the blu-ray six times and show overwhelming support for the show even if it was a relatively cheaply made show but if you made it a great show haruhi tapped into this then you could sell shitloads you know if you made it an actual great show and aimed it at otaku they were all gonna watch it they were all gonna buy six dvds you're gonna have a bestseller on your hand monogatari madoka magica aimed at this audience and squarely so, and with, like, precision marketing and really great production. Aniplex knocking it out of the park in both of those cases on the production end. Same producer, I think, as well, if I remember correct. And incidentally, that is why Monogatari has been possible. Monogatari has felt like this impossible thing the whole time that it's existed, that, like, this crazy-ass meta light novel, first of all, could even find a way to be adapted into anime, which is the ingenuity of Shaft and Shinbo and the team there. And yes, I say Shinbo because I, I know for a fact that Shinbo was the one who told Nisio Isin how they were going to do it, and that was what like convinced him it could be an anime. And it was just so overwhelmingly successful that Aniplex, I guess, just took their, you know, just said, hey... Let's fucking go all out on this thing. Like, you guys made this extremely weird and creative and crazy and everyone loved it. So just make it weirder and more creative and more crazy. Spend five years on the fucking Kizumonogatari movie. Split it into three movies. You'll make back the fucking money three times over. Like, you did it. You fucking, you nailed it. You made the perfect otaku media piece. And honestly... I think Monogatari swallowed the rest of them. I think Monogatari was so good, it drained all the life force out of the rest of light novels and, and meta anime and just became the only one. Because, I mean, otherwise, what are you going to do? Copy Monogatari? Like, you're just going to look like a fucking copycat, you know? So, so there it is. I mean, it has every product you could imagine. I own more shit from Monogatari than anything else because there's just so much shit for it. I mean... I guess this is what it would have felt like to be into, like, fucking Udose Yatsura in the 80s, or, like, I don't know, it, Eva at any point, like, it, but in, in Japan, like, or Gundam, like, you just, you have a bunch of it because they just make so much of it, and the character designs are so fucking good. I think I'm gonna buy a fucking statue of Mayo Chiki when it's sitting next to Senjo Gahara. When I first established a Patreon, it was very clear in my goals from the beginning that the intention of using Patreon was that if I made enough money, I would only have to make one video a month, but it could be a huge video. Like, I had always been trying to get, this is back when I was per video, I was always trying to get my per video rate up to like... Like, in the beginning, it was, like, $200 per video. And so I would always try to make $1,000 because that was what I saw as, like, the living expense I needed. And so my goal was to get the Patreon up to where one video was worth $1,000 and then just make one video a month, but it would be a gigantic research project. This was the way I was envisioning the Patreon going. From the very start, and eventually I made it there. However, by that point, the paradigm of how YouTube worked had shifted so heavily that it was no longer seen as like an optimal business strategy to have good, long, like well-produced videos, which is what it had been before. 
literally when I got into YouTube, the only stuff that was like really successful, it, it usually couldn't be too long, but if it was, it had to be like tightly produced and fully edited and fully scripted and like have character and comedy. It needed to be either Mr. Plinkett or Ego Raptor or, you know, eventually YMS came along and some of these people weren't as edited or as like scripted as others, but Generally, the thought was you need to make a big project that's going to make a splash and get attention. And that's what I was chasing. And I thought that would make it like if I started making those kinds of videos, I would blow up. Because I know that those are the kind of videos I do the best. Those are the kind of videos everyone likes from me the most is the big projects. Historically, at all times, all of my fans will tell me their favorite videos are either... One of my long form analytical videos, one of my like big epic point videos that's got like lots of editing behind it or just like a really well thought out vlog that just seemed like it was bubbling under the surface of my mind for fucking years. Like, you know, which which any of the ones that people say are their favorites, they're all like that. They're all something that I had been thinking about for a considerable amount of time. And this was not the first representation of the uh, the topic. And yet, all of the wisdom of how to grow was to avoid this type of video. It's, you have to have video frequency. You've got to have a video out twice a week. You've got to have, like, or three times a week even. You've got to fucking just constantly be churning out videos. Um, you know, so all that matters is that they're a little interesting. All that matters is that they make enough of a point. That's what most of YouTube is, is attempting to make enough of a point to justify a video. That's all it is. Do I have enough to say about this that I can squeeze out five to 10, 15, if I'm really pushing it, you know, uh, minutes worth of content about it? And if the answer is yes, I can make a video. And if I can stretch that out to 15 minutes, even if it is only two minutes of idea, if I can find a way to pad the video long enough, it's just extra money. By the time I made it to $1,000 a video, I realized that the only way I was going to survive in the current YouTube paradigm of producing content frequently, but still having it be like enough of high quality that, you know, a weekly upload is still something people will look forward to. I'm going to need a full-time editor. I had to employ Devu and that meant that a thousand dollars a video and only one video a month was no longer enough because it's not a thousand dollars for my expense anymore. It's also Devu's living expense because he has to edit for me full-time now. And once I wanted to move out of the house, once I wanted to, you know, start saving up and, and once I started getting really fucking paranoid about taxes and wanted to have a whole lot of money in my bank account at all times, that was when I decided that, you know, I hit a thousand dollars a video, but it was now we need to make four thousand dollars a month is the only way that we're going to keep this empire going, you know, or thirty five hundred was usually because it, you know, every every video depreciates significantly in value if you're doing it per video. So the first one might've been worth a thousand. The second was probably worth 700. The third is probably worth 500, etc. So it's usually I was trying to get up to like 3,500. And that was why when I switched to monthly, that was the, the, the overall goal. So in spite of the fact that I'm making way more money than what I even thought initially I required to make one video a month, because I want to keep growing and I want to have, you know, a bigger audience and I want even more money because now I've like realized the realities of adult life and what having more money will eventually allow me to do, um, you know, with, with like being able to up my production because I now understand what I can do with more money, which I don't think I really knew as much earlier, but now I kind of understand better. So ironically, instead of switching to monthly and then going full tilt in the direction that I'd always been planning to go. Instead, I took things in the exact opposite direction. Because what I did was I spent an entire year basically teaching myself to be the YouTuber. The guy with videos out all the time. I was just cranking out vlogs every time I had an idea. You know, getting people involved just through gimmicks and memes and narrative elements and little things that make every video unique. So even though you're watching shit tons of content, that's all kind of the same and isn't really that enriching for the most part. Like some of them are, but they're scattered amongst all the other stuff. You don't know really what grade of content you're going to get when you click on it. You just got to kind of gamble and roll the dice, but there's always something in there. So it doesn't feel like a total waste of time. You know, like my bare minimum has always been like, would I 
want to watch this? Like, would I feel good about having watched this? And I watch lots of cult of personality shit on YouTube, especially before I started dating when I had all the time in the world to fill with, you know, people on the internet to be my companionship via YouTube videos because I don't like talking to almost anyone directly. And now that I finally do, I don't need it as much. <laughs> but like, and I don't have time to produce it as much, but I also am just trying to chase something bigger than, you know, than just that disposable content that that constantly comes out because I don't think it's what I'm the best at. I don't think it's the stuff people are going to remember me for in the long run. I don't think it's the stuff that people pledge me money for. There's some people who will pledge me money because they just want me to be able to sustain the lifestyle of constant content production because they do want it. But first of all, it's not sustainable for either one of us because not only can I not always be in a place in life where I want to produce just a constant stream of vlogs, but you won't always be in a place of life in life where you have time to watch that. You know, like there are plenty of YouTubers who like game grumps. I followed them for a strong while and watched like game grumps. I followed them for a strong while and watched all their shit. But like, eventually I just got into a place in life where I didn't have time to spend 20 minutes a day on something that, I didn't feel had enough value in each individual episode to prioritize it. You know, not that I think even necessarily the show got way worse. I just think it was not as valuable to me at a time when I had less time to spare. And that inevitably will happen to everybody, especially if they're following such a overwhelming schedule. And people don't like to lose track of the narrative. People don't like when there's so much stuff coming out that they're not watching that they feel like they don't get to participate anymore. And it becomes difficult for me to communicate with my fans where I've got so much deep lore content, so much stuff on all these other channels and all these weird things and like backroom stuff that comes out constantly. Um... I totally understand why people can't watch all of it, but I also lose track of what I've said where, who knows what, what part, like, what page is everybody on, and I don't really want that anymore. That's why I'm going in the direction of having a series on the main channel that's going to be, like, my main focus for a while, because I want everyone to be able to participate. I want it to be something that has all the crazy meta elements and you know, cult of personality stuff that, that my fan, my close fans have been experiencing this whole time, but like, it's all in one place and you can just participate in it and, it, and have fun and understand it right from the get go. And it'll also have more effort put into it because I'm just taking my fucking time on it, you know? So it's like YouTube does not incentivize this behavior. And in some ways it never truly has, because while those series have been successful, a huge element of their success was the topicality of what they were discussing. At the time that, you know, Sequelitis was really big, um, the idea of, like, revisiting retro video games with an analytical lens was, like, a major part of YouTube culture. You know, Angry Video Game Nerd had been, like, the first really famous uh, internet reviewer, I guess, uh, at least of video games, and... He, his entire gimmick was that he talked about old games, but, like, wrote real thorough reviews from, like, a game design kind of standpoint about them. So Ego Raptor kind of took up that torch, took it in an even more analytical direction, was one of the early people to do so, and did it in a really entertaining way. But if his video had not been, like, a video game analysis at a time when video game analysis was popular and about a game that, like, everyone remembers from their childhood because Mega Man is fucking a huge franchise, it wouldn't have been such a big deal. Just like Mr. Plinkett's Star Wars videos were such a big deal because it was fucking Star Wars. People don't go back and rewatch his Boss Baby review all the time. You know, they go back and rewatch the Star Wars video because they were already emotionally invested in Star Wars before they ever watched the video. And this presents me with a further quandary because, like, a lot of the things I want to talk about are very obscure and don't have that kind of pull based on their name alone. And I have to kind of lead people to this stuff and, like, convince them to care about it by, you know, using persuasive titles and even ones that just, like, hide what the video is really about or, or phrase it in a way that is as broad as possible, like the writer in the background of 40 years of Japanese animation, as opposed to a history of 
uh, you know, Shinichiro Wakabayashi or whatever the hell his name is, such as the writer who kept anime weird, as opposed to a history of Chiaki J. Konaka, who probably not that many people have heard of. So in consideration of all of this, how can I possibly continue to grow and expand and make more money while also becoming the artist I've always wanted to be and that people value the most from me, the one who creates these bigger videos that are more thought out, that have more research, that have more analytical depth, that have more editing, that have more time and thought put into them, um, you know, while participating in a system that does not reward these behaviors. Well, the key is marketing. The key really is always marketing because there's, there's tons and tons and tons of weird shit out there that's extremely popular. There's tons of stuff that looks ugly at a glance, that seems unappealing when you describe it, that just doesn't seem like something that you would like. But either because of word of mouth spread, which can only come after some form of marketing, even if it's just that it aired on television, that is enough marketing for a lot of people. The existence of something on TV often justifies itself. It's like, well, someone must watch it because it's on TV, you know? So there's a lot of ways that you can lure people in and convince them that what you're, you know, what you've got over here is interesting, even if it doesn't seem like it is at first. And those techniques are the only ways I'm ever going to be able to grow my channel because literally, if you haven't seen the interview I did with Tommy Oliver, the uh, Poly Station 2, if you haven't seen the video I did with Poly Station 2, you need to check that out because he talks about the way that YouTube sort of processes channels that haven't been uploading frequently enough or that it considers dead and how it becomes extremely difficult to re-engage your subscribers unless you're like providing exactly the content they want or if you're someone who they're so hype about watching that they'll watch anything you do, I suppose, but like, you know, you just got to have a certain kind of audience to even be the kind of person who can you know, disappear for a while to work on something. And like Matthew Matosis, his audience knows exactly what they're getting from him. They're going to wait as long as it takes and they'll always be excited when it shows up because it's exactly what they want, you know? And that's what I want to give people. And I want to, and that's what I want to give people. And I think that Matthew Matosis has done a good job of marketing his own excursion into more obscure fields. Like he has started talking about a series of games from a uh, producer. He's re recently, he started up a series of videos talking about each of the games from a certain developer who is fairly obscure. None of their games are like widely talked about, but he's kind of touched on them and used them as examples in the past. So there's already a curiosity amongst his hardcore audience and a lot of people who probably started playing these games based on him having recommended a couple of them before, you know, not having done full reviews, but just like recommendations. And because probably a sizable chunk of his audience cares about this game. He already has some foothold in the ability to talk about it, but then before he even started reviewing it, he did an entire video just like explaining the games in like clear terms for people who think that they are overwhelming or who are afraid to approach them and like trying to hard sell you on the fact that you can play these fucking games. They have appeal. You'll get it. Just, I promise. I know it looks scary. I know it looks weird, but you'll get it. You'll get it. I promise you'll get it. This is how I want to like tell people about endless Jess. Just like, I get it. I know. I know he's in a, he's in a basement. He's rambling. You don't understand everything he's saying. Cause he's making lots of references, but just fucking watch the whole video. And by the end, you'll be like oh okay I understand I get what it was going on this is a great video I just had to watch the whole thing you know because unlike most of what I'm used to on YouTube it is not just one note all the way through there is a narrative here and that's what I also want to incorporate in my upcoming series I've barely even touched on my original point that I wanted to make about anime which is essentially that while I said that the 80s was the best decade in that video, and I mostly meant that because of the fact that, yes, they were willing to take huger risks on productions and try to create the best product possible. However, they were also mostly just making movies and OVAs, which are a lot shorter, and, you know, it's not as difficult to do that as it would be to make an entire series that's consistently good. And what TV anime was nailing from 
Eva onwards, pretty much, is a deluge of fairly consistently good shows. Unfortunately, there were a ton of shit shows along with that, and, you know, the era will be as remembered for one as it will be for the other. But, like, rewatching Ava, that show is perfect. Like, if you just cut off the last two episodes and think of End of Ava as the last two episodes, which it literally invites you to do, it wants you to do that, it's like, please, this is episode 25 and 26, please. Like, title cards, they've each got their own ending thing. They got their own EDs. If you think of it that way, the show is flawless. There's nothing wrong. It's, it's airtight. It's perfect. Every line of dialogue makes perfect sense. The story is complete. Um, every image looks amazing. There's a few parts where there's, you know, unfortunate, like, reused animation and stuff. But honestly, the production of Ava is so much better than anything being made today that to, like, remember it as a troubled production is really laughable. Like, the fact that its reputation is those last two episodes is so unfortunate when everything else is, like, godly. And plenty of... And plenty of great stuff's been made since, and plenty of great stuff's still getting made. However, I feel as though the baseline quality is dipping, and it's mostly in these last couple of years, where suddenly I'm seeing the exact same looking backgrounds in every show, lots of CG pedestrians everywhere, anime is just looking cheaper and cheaper and feeling cheaper, and so much of it feels redundant and repetitive, and it's the same shit I've seen before, and I'm not seeing enough new stuff. And the new stuff that I am seeing is so clearly undercut by the fact that it didn't have more put into it. That, like, a little longer in the oven, and it would be the 10 out of 10 classic that could compete with any of those old shows that we bring up all the time. But I can't name anything that's come out in the last two years that I'm going to mention in the same breath as, like, Gurren Lagan or Ava, or, you know, any other show I would mention in the breadth of those shows. Shirobako was the last show I think I gave a 10 in terms of, like, recency. And I realize this is different for everybody. Obviously, this is a matter of taste. Some people will probably believe... Them. Some people probably have more favorites that came out last year than any other year. And that's fine. I understand. I understand why you might feel that way. But, like, I've seen so much stuff from so many decades and when I, in so many years, and when I line them up next to each other, I look at what was the mediocre shit coming out in 2015, and then I look at what was the mediocre shit coming out in 2018, and it feels like a, sh a stark decline. And, and even the better stuff, like, a lot of stuff that has a comparable parallel, like, Tsuki Ga Kirei, which I made fun of in that, um how in the uh the fucking video about the mediocrity that show immediately reminded me of wandering sun aesthetically and in tone like it's another show about middle schooler drama with a washed out white tone 